Home to tossing grenades and windmills. Free cyber. By T. C. Ricks and Ken Leitner. Chapter 53. Ezekiel was in a buoyant mood. He had hired he had his hired Emily now, and the overall mood of his impromptu party created joy that spread through him like warm milk. All he had to do was sit back and let things happen. All was well with the world. The alcohol-fed familiarity his employees were showing disturbed him slightly. But for now, he let them wave and smile, and he waved and smiled back. However, he made mental note of the ones that acted too familiar with him. Then he noticed the guards standing outside of the intelligence office in full battle gear. They most definitely were not celebrating. Sobriety washed over him like an iron fist in a velvet glove. He looked at Emily. Go somewhere safe and go somewhere safe and let me handle this. She obviously did not understand, but nodded in compliance. Good. Just the way Ezekiel liked it. He moved to the soldiers and whispered, What's the situation? There's a security breach, sir. What kind of security breach? Wait, is that my office door on the monitor? Ezekiel felt a slight clenching in his gut. The records in his office machine could do some real damage to his plans. We're waiting here, sir, in case we're summoned. Mary Heath took a gun and went in to confront them. She's the only person we could find with sufficient clearance. She talked to them for a bit and then walked up to your office. We thought she was taking them to you, but our security cameras cannot access the inside of your office. It was obvious that the procedure in place frustrated the guard. Ezekiel couldn't blame them. He made a mental note to review the security protocols for, an intel for the intelligence division. He would have to reconsider the importance of keeping his covert data secure versus the need to respond quickly to this kind of event. He took one of the officer's automatic rifles and headed back to his office. The guard started to protest, but Ezekiel just stared him down. Ezekiel smiled quickly. He knew the guard had done the right thing. He should have found a safe room, but this particular room held too many of his skeletons. The clenching in his gut got stronger, and he began to run. Clark moved much faster with Mary's help, but Mary only knew so much, and Norn was very thorough with his security. Clark did not know if any hacker in the world could break a system like Norn's. However, they'd come all this way, and they likely would never get another opportunity again. Mary whispered in hushed tones, Would you please hurry up? Is there Emily sneered at Mary. Quiet! Emily glared back at Emily. Emily pleaded with Mary. You're breaking his concentration. Clark shook his head. It's no use. I can't crack this, Mary said. Let me try. The request surprised Clark and Emily. They looked at another, one another briefly, shrugged, and in unison said, Go ahead. Clark stood to get out of the way. Mary sat down and took over where Clark had stopped. Clark had breached Norn's personal codes. Mary could s use her legitimate passwords on the rest. Clark watched, trying to memorize the keystrokes for a second before Emily interrupted. Clark, someone's coming, she whispered. Ezekiel rushed in and saw Emily first. For a moment, he thought she was the Emily he had just left. What the hell are you doing here? I told you to wait someplace safe. Then he saw Mary. He was about to ask what was going on when he saw Clark. Clark, you Sarian! How could he be alive? He was, it simply could not be. No one wanted to aim his rifle at Clark and shoot him. Every instinct he had screamed at him to pull the trigger, but he did not. His curiosity overwhelmed him. He had to know. How are you still alive? Twice in one night, Clark could hardly believe how badly this had gone. He could only stare for a few moments before finally asking, What are you talking about? I want to know how you escaped the missile attack on your headquarters that I so carefully arranged. Slowly, finally, it dawned on Clark. Norn had arranged the missile attack. Shadow Leader had caused the attack. Ezekiel Norn... Ezekiel Norn was Shadow Leader. It all made sense now. But once again, he needed more time. Perhaps if he stalled long enough, Mary would discover what they were looking for. Clark had no idea how that might help Emily or him, but at least they might avert the terror strike. He began to tell Norn something. He decided the only detail to leave out of the conversation was their current hideout. Norn was captivated as Clark began to tell his story. Mary Nutt was not sure what to think about her two captives. On the one hand, she recognized Clark as the annoying gold farmer hacker. On the other hand, she knew someone like him had made her son wealthy in Marauder's Crag. 
She believed him when he claimed credit. He had no reason to lie about something like that. She entered a couple more passwords and started to scan Norn's files. If Ezekiel asked, she could claim she was just checking what Clark and Emily had accessed and whether they had manipulated anything before she arrived. In truth, she was checking that as well as checking out their story. She had no doubt he was an anarchist and probably associated with revolutionaries. She also assumed that he was here at Aquanoir to cause more chaos and cost her employer more money. The servers he had accessed contained sensitive financial information. However, they held data about Aquanoir's military and security operations. The Aquanoir's game data was on a different floor. She thought it was possible that they didn't know that, but she also felt it was unlikely. Clark Yossarian did not seem that careless to her. Mary found the suspicious-looking files, opened them, and started to read. At first, it was a bunch of supremely boring financial planning data. Still, she thought, why, hadn't they taken, why had they taken such a risk by breaking into Aquanoir headquarters? Whatever they were doing here, it had to be important. Either they had told the truth, or they had planned something even bigger than Marauder's Crack. Either way, Mary needed to know what it was. She found references in the financial data to other files, so she opened them and started scanning those as well. She supposed it was possible that Clark had planted these files, but so far, but so far she saw no evidence of that. He could not have accessed this computer from the secure data room, and she had watched his every move since then. She heard Clark babbling about escaping an assassination attempt in downtown Atlanta. She mentally noted that Ezekiel filled in a few details for Clark. She'd always assumed Ezekiel bent a few rules, but was shocked to discover he attempted assassinations here in her home city. Then she opened a diary file. The trail led her to meeting with Mike, discuss the strike plans. Mike agrees to go to Columbia and smuggle in those thugs we can use as patsies. He plans to do the operation himself. Drama game thing at Central Park in three weeks. Casualty should be high enough. And then one leaker, Mike dead. Met with his thugs, dangerous pair. Paid them some from petty cash. They look capable of pulling the strike off without Mike's help. It was worth a try. Aquanoir can claim credit for capturing them either way. Mary's jaw dropped. They had told the truth. The drama event was tonight, and Mary realized the horror. And Mary realized with horror, her son was on his way there. She had to stop him, but how? There was no time. Clark finished telling Ezekiel about how he discovered Gabriel, and he could tell Norn had just lost interest. His attempts to buy time were failing miserably. Norn kept fiddling with the rifle in a way that Clark knew meant Clark had planned to use the rifle at any moment. Mary was still hunched over the terminal reading, and she probably figured she had plenty of time. After all, she could keep checking long after Ezekiel and or after Clark and Emily were hauled off the premises to who knows what horse. Clark's mind raced, trying to find some detail that would distract Norn a little longer. He scanned the room, hoping for something that would trigger a useful memory. His eyes landed on a terminal he recognized. It was a shadow net terminal. But this one had a considerably larger CPU case than any he had seen before. Of course, Norn, as shadow leader, had access to all the cells. That was the central computer they'd all been tied into. If Clark could somehow get away with that case, they had some hope of reorganizing the resistance cells. Clark started to speak again, but stopped when he noticed Mary moving. Mary looked up from Ezekiel's computer, pulled out her gun, and shot the most powerful world on the planet. She hit him in the forehead. The bullet traveled faster than the speed of sound as it struck Ezekiel's skull. The initial energy of the impact caused the lead slug to flatten out in a mushroom shape as it continued in Ezekiel's brain, into Ezekiel's brain. As the bullet pushed bits of gray matter aside, it tore a baseball-sized chunk in the hole in, uh, hole in Ezekiel's brain. Mary had drawn and fired so rapidly that the bits, the, the bits of destroyed brain had only just started processing the visual data of the threat. In other words, Ezekiel died fast. Of course, that did not st stop Mary from unloading the entire clip into his fallen and then prone form. She had to be sure, after all. She looked at a shocked Clark and Emily. I know where they are going to hit. You were right. Norn's planned it all. It's an attack on drama, on the drama premiere at Central Olympic Park tomorrow morning. My son will be there with the school band. We have to get there right now to stop these people. She stared at them, waiting for their response while patiently reloading her gun. Emil Emily looked 
but if we know, surely we can... We are about to be hunted fugitives. By the time we convince anyone of the truth of our story, it will be too late. My son is involved. Delay is unacceptable. What she left unsaid was that she had just done to Ezekiel Norm what she would do to anyone else that got in her way. Clark looked like he was in deep, he was deep in thought. He was slow, stupid, and mostly harmless, but he had been helpful in saving her son's life, so she would give him a few seconds. Then he carefully said, Is there anything that we can use or do here that will help us when we get there? Mary thought about that for a moment. That only took a few seconds, but Ezekiel's office would have things that others would not. Actually, yes. We can probably use a few of his codes to direct law enforcement to keep an eye out for certain things regardless of what we're doing. We just can't tell them why. We can probably also arrange for... Wait! Ezekiel has a private helicopter. We could take that and get there much faster. Clark smiled. Perfect. They quickly went through, went to work assessing the, accessing the net through Ezekiel's terminal. The amount of secrets that Mary found was astonishing. Ezekiel's death would have major consequences for the corporation as well as the United States. In fact, despite its status as a diminished, diminished power, it might have global consequences as well. The more she looked, the more concerned she became. If it had not involved a threat to her son, she might have regretted killing Ezekiel. Fortunately, that was not really an issue for her. He was dead, and after what she had learned tonight, she was glad. After Mary left the room, Clark ran back and grabbed the shadow net computer he had seen earlier. He left all the peripherals like the monitor and keyboard. He just quietly, quickly and quietly disconnected the CPU case, hefted it under, under his arm, and then ran off to, ca- to catch this up with the others. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. I'm Thomas Ricks. Music by Melanie Ricks. Voices by Skip Huffman and Josie Bergen Lawson. Copyright 2012. Kenneth Leitner and Red Anvil Amalgamated to fight the forces of evil!